Yeah, Absolutely. excellent. So, well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. And thank you for, uh, for, for joining me this morning. Uh, I hope to share with you a little bit about ELC World Hunger um, and a bit about hunger in the United States and around the world and talk together in that. But I also want to make sure we have time for questions afterwards. And we end here at... Uh, 11. 11. You can even go till 10 after 11. I can go to 10 after 11. So if you if you get bored later on, it's his fault. <laughs> okay. Um, so to to explain a little bit more about what I do, um, I work for ELCA World Hunger, which is a ministry of the ELCA, uh, and my job is the program director of hunger education. So what that means is that I direct the development of educational resources and programs to help people in the ELCA learn about hunger and poverty. Uh, my training is in theology, uh, so I did my doctorate work at Loyola in Chicago uh, and was a teacher at Loyola uh, and at Lewis University. Uh, and I actually still teach now. Um, so my background is in teaching and theology, so it works out really well to do this kind of work. I left some samples of resources back there that you could take, and I have some more that I'll share with you uh, in a little bit, but that's essentially what I do. One of the other things that I do is uh, uh, for, for our team, kind of, manage the data about hunger and, and poverty. So I do some data analysis because that's also in my background uh, when it comes to statistics and things like that. So I'm going to share with you some numbers. So if you aren't, uh, aren't into numbers, it'll be quick. If you are into numbers, well, we can take a long time because um, they get very <coughs> uh, Some of the numbers are hopeful, uh, some of them not so hopeful, but we're going to dive into them a little bit. If at any time you have a question uh, or if you need me to repeat something or anything like that, just let me know. Okay, cool. All right. So when we talk about hunger, uh, in the U.S. specifically, uh, the term that we use is food security. Uh, and what food security means is that you have access to enough food for an active, healthy life uh, for either yourself, if you're measuring it individually, or for your household, uh, all household members, if you're measuring it as a household. So food, uh, food security. Uh, the term that's used instead of hunger in the U.S. is usually food insecure because it's a little bit better of a, or more specific of a definition. Uh, and the way that we describe it in the U.S. is that in the U.S. We're, we're fortunate enough to have recurrent but not chronic food insecurity most often. And what that means is that there are periods of time throughout the year when a family or an individual will be uh, food insecure and unable to, to access their, uh, their next meal. Uh, fortunately, we, we, while we have some chronic hunger in the U.S. and some chronic undernourishment, it's not quite as, as deep or prolonged as we see uh, in developing countries. Um, it's still a problem. Uh, and part of the reason that we don't quite have that is because of the, the social programs that help to provide for people who are in need or in situations of need. If you think about recurrent, not chronic, you can kind of think of the times when that would, when, when that would recur. The end of the month, right? When benefits run out, food pantries see a spike in people coming in. Seasonal times, so seasonal workers, especially in agriculture and tourism. Right? So you have folks who are really dependent on salary from service industry or from agriculture. Uh, it's not a salary that allows them to save very much for rainy days. Uh, and so then when those seasons end, then they become food insecure. Even some uh, uh, lower wage construction workers. Right? <coughs> construction season dials back, they have a hard time making ends meet. In the U.S. in 2018, about 11.1% of households were food insecure. That's down from, uh, in 2016, uh, it was about 12.8%. This is actually the lowest level since the recession. Uh, and so we're making pretty good progress, uh, pretty good progress there, but it's still 11.1%, so it's still pretty high. Um, but during the recession, it peaked near 15%. In the state of Michigan, we're at about 12.9%. 4.9% of households had a member, at least one member, who experienced food insecurity. In terms of the numbers, it was 37.2 million. Uh, yeah. Do you do you have data on where in Michigan those pockets are? We have some. Yeah, and I'm actually going to show you a map of the Southeast Michigan Synod uh, in, a, in a minute that'll that'll show that. We have uh, we have some, but it's also within 100% of the counties in the U.S. So every county has some population that's food insecure. Uh, in Michigan, so Michigan's a little bit out, right? So you have some pockets of wealth. So if you look at like, you know, well, around, around Ann Arbor, you have some, but you also have pockets of high food insecurity around Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. 
You look at around the Metro Detroit area, you have some pockets of very high wealth, you have some pockets of high food insecurity. And then one of the, the areas that gets kind of forgotten with that, uh, throughout Michigan, the rural areas. Right. The really high rural food insecurity. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data on rural food insecurity. <coughs> uh, I talked to a woman from the USDA uh, Economic uh, Research Services uh, like earlier this year. She said that's the biggest problem in addressing rural food insecurity. We just don't have the data. Nobody's doing the studies. Right? Or if they do them, they'll talk about a rural area this size instead of talking about like you know an urban area that's this size. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the 4.3 percent that had very low food security, these are folks who are missing meals. Right? These are folks for whom that meal is not going to come. Right? Uh, either through a pantry or a food service provider or with their benefits or things like that. So 4.3 percent, still down from 4.9 percent. So it's still on the de decrease. But that 4.3 still represents over 12 and a half million people in the United States. All right, so here in Washtenaw County. In Washtenaw County, 54,353 people were below the poverty line in 2018, according to the most recent data that we have. That poverty threshold varies depending on kind of the makeup of the household. So if you have like four people, it might be uh, like two children, two adults, or one adult, three children, and things like that. Uh, so, it, but it hovers somewhere between twenty-five thousand five hundred fifty-four dollars and twenty-five thousand nine hundred dollars for a family of four. So it's really, really low, right? A very low threshold, and you still have in Washington County fifty-four thousand people who are below that. Um, if we look below the, the poverty threshold, fifteen and a half percent is our rate here in Washington. Statewide, it's about fourteen point one, so we're a little bit higher here in Washington. Uh, and in terms of food insecurity, 13.2% are food insecure. 13.2% so of people in Washtenaw County are food insecure. Uh, now just to back up one minute here, um, one of the things that you'll see on here, uh, that you won't see on here, uh, maybe glaring in its, in its absence, that should say 2018, by the way, sorry about that. Um, the, uh, uh, is child food insecure, child hunger. Because you often hear about how many children are hungry, right? Child hunger is really, really hard to measure. Um, because in a household, like think if you have kids in the house, if you have a shortage of food, who's going to go without? The adults, the older siblings, right? And usually the youngest kids are going to get the food first. And so the household might be food insecure, but that child is technically not. Right? That child's getting all the, the food that they need. Um, and so it's really hard to measure. Okay, um, and so that's why I don't I don't even put it up here because it's, it's it's really really difficult to measure. Uh, anyway, so Washtenaw County. Yeah. I, uh, you would have thought that Washtenaw would be um, have a better below the poverty threshold. Yeah, you, think, you would think it would have a, a, a less of a or a, a lower poverty rate, um, but actually it's quite a, you know, fairly at least compared to statewide, a fairly high poverty rate. Um, you have some uh, urban poverty, like I said, around Ann Arbor and, and Ypsilanti, a lot of rural poverty uh, as well like, uh, in some of the, uh, the areas outside the city, city limits, but it's actually fairly high. And I'll show you on the next map here. <clears throat> so this, we're in the Southeast Michigan Synod, right? So this is a map of the Southeast Michigan Synod. I'm come over here so you can see it. I know that they, the wording on there might be a little bit small. This is um, median household income. Right, uh, in 2018 numbers uh, by zip code. Right, the darker green colors uh, is median household income of between 100,000 to 150,000, which is very high. Median household income uh, nationwide is about 60,000, right? uh, which is actually pretty high since the recession. Uh, the orange is zero to 30,000. So those are households that are most of them are going to be below that poverty threshold. So you see around Detroit. A lot of the a lot of the orange here, see up here towards Pontiac, right? Genesee, Flint. Uh, if you look out uh, I ninety four in Washtenaw, you have these pockets here that are uh, in the thirty thousand to fifty thousand range, right? Median household income again by zip code, so you're not going to see unless we were to drill down really close to that that poverty uh, below thirty thousand. Um, but what you see with these the folks in the the kind of lime green here. 
these are, are, are folks that we might consider underemployed, right? So they're employed, making money, but probably not enough to meet all of their household needs. And the black dots are ELC congregations. So one of the things that we provided to, to congregations and the synods was just kind of an overview of where is it that you have these pockets of poverty? Where do you have pockets of wealth? The interesting thing is when you look at areas like here, where you have kind of pockets of poverty really close to pockets of great wealth. You know, so if you have a median household income of 100 to 150, you're about double the median household income in the United States, right? And you have that next to an area where it transitions from 30 to 50,000 into under 30,000, right? So you have these areas of, of that. But you also see a lot of the kind of rural underemployment around outside on the outskirts of Flint, up in northern Lapeer, and it's Claire, right? Um, you see some of these areas of, of underemployment. And as I said, it doesn't drill down into smaller uh, uh, segments uh, to see these, uh, uh, to see like the number of an orange would represent that under the poverty level. But it's still kind of instructive. One of the things we can actually surmise or, uh, from or the area around like Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti is because we don't see like these pockets like this of the orange, there's a little bit more mixed income communities. Right? We're not seeing like the kind of sharp disjuncture like you see here, this line between like the points and Detroit, where you see it goes from the highest level to the lowest level across the street. Uh, here, this would be the street here would probably be Mack Avenue, that curved street. You don't see that up in Washington as much. So it's more mixed income, which is why it might go under notice. Right? Alright. Any questions about that? Yeah. What is the equality of food for or just briefly you were touching on or do the household touch on food produce or um, in terms of measuring terms food of security? Measuring security? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so they don't currently, the USDA, when it does the research, and they provide all that, that food security data, they don't currently ask about the quality, okay. right? Uh, which is problematic, because it's one thing to say, if you're, if you're food secure, but you're, uh, you know, you're surviving on, uh, on, on food that's not nutritionally dense, you know, are, you, are you really doing well? According to their own definitions, no, right? Uh, but it relies on survey data uh, for people just reporting, like, you know, were there times when you didn't have enough food, right? Um, there's other data that will look at like access to quality of food. One of the interesting pieces is uh, that, the, that the USDA learned a few years ago. Um, you've heard of food deserts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? So like food desert is an area where you don't have uh, access to like a supermarket or, or easy access to nutritious foods, right? Uh, and the thought was, well, if you don't have access to those things, then you're gonna have you know, high rates of obesity, you're gonna have problems with um, you know, anemia, other nutrition-related disorders, things like that. What the USDA found was it was actually not as strongly correlated as something called a food swamp, which is not a food desert, a food swamp is an overabundance of unhealthy foods. So you have lots of McDonald's and Burger Kings and, and corner stores selling uh, um, processed and packaged goods. Uh, if you have an overabundance of those, that's actually more strongly correlated with poor nutrition <coughs> than having a food desert. Uh, but nobody's really looking at those food swamps, right? Uh, so now we're starting to, you know, we're trying, starting to see them. In Washington County, the, the access to, to, to fresh foods is a little, bit, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. You get out to areas like Chelsea. Um, Chelsea's very fortunate to have a, a grocery store. Manchester doesn't, right? So you start getting into some of these areas where you're, you're getting 10, 15 miles away from a large grocery store, you're paying more money for food, it's getting harder to access. The flip of that is because all the farming families in, in Washington, they have access to a lot of farms. Right? And so thankfully that's, they've been able to move into farmers markets. Still not perfect solution. Where do they have farmers markets? Downtown Chelsea, Carrytown, right? Areas where they're hard, still hard for, for people who are in more, more remote sections of town. <coughs> um, so yeah, the quality of food is really uh, really challenging. Uh, so globally, uh, domestically here in the U.S., we got some good news, right? We're back to pre-recession levels, which is good news. Globally, that's not the case. Uh, globally, for the, for the first time in, in a couple of decades, we're seeing an increase in hunger. And it's an increase enough that the Food and Agricultural Organization 
uh, is doubtful that we're going to meet the sustainable development goal of zero hunger. Um, we were on track to. Now it looks like it's been reversed. So we've gone from 784 million in 2015, about 10.6, up 0.2% to 821 million in 2018. Uh, severe food insecurity is also on the rise, 9.2% versus 8% in 2016. So that's on the rise. Uh, and so globally, we're really concerned that, that we may be losing all the progress we made since the, since the 1980s and 1990s. Um, you can see kind of here. This is just a graph from the 2000s, from 2005 to 2017. You can see the, the uptick came down here. 2015, 2014 started coming back. <coughs> Uh, yeah. what, what's the explanation yeah so that's a good question um, we're actually going to get into that perfect segue look at that what causes it what are some of the potential causes um, and for that uh, maybe we can just do this together since we're small group uh, let's see if we can, you can see that all right if we take a look at something like hunger and take a look at the Ross question what is it? What's causing it? Okay. What are some of the things that come to mind when we talk about causes of hunger? Availability. Food availability of food, right? So, food availability. Drought. Drought, right? Um, drought might be part of food availability. Yeah. Cost. Drought. Cost. Cost, right? So, uh, cost of food. Well, lack of uh, farmland. Lack of farmland, right? Uh, you know, land access. And the approximate access for transportation. Say that one more time. And the approximate access for transportation. For transportation to to get to food. To reach to access. <clears throat> to access the food, right? So uh, I'm actually going to put this. Uh, I'm going to separate these: food availability versus food access. And put transportation over here. Yeah, that's great. Um, governments? Mm -hmm. How so? Well, if, if they hoard, you know, they send something over overseas sure. to the um, government, but they don't distribute it. Not distribute it, right? So what we could say is. Um, I'm going to put that as inequitable distribution, ah. right? So you that's, have, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know what you're going for. Yeah, uh, the uh, good inequitable distribution, right? Yeah. So you have some classes that get a lot, some classes that get a little, right? Uh, or some classes that get kind of like the, the tribes, first cut, the right? tribes. tribes, right? Yeah. Things like that. What other things? How about the, uh, the ability or the availability to prepare food once you have it? Sure, sure. sure. So, um, uh, let's see how we frame that. So, kitchens. what's that? Kitchens. Kitchens, right. Well, I would say, you know, uh, whether it's, let, let's put it on, under kind of a broader rubric um, of technology, right? And we can say in the kitchen. Okay. There's a reason I'm kind of branching that out. Yeah. And knowledge of how to prepare. Knowledge of how to prepare, what, right? So, how to identify, um, how to identify yeah. specific items to put. So, lack of nutrition education. Okay. What well, storage? <coughs> storage of uh, food in the lack of storage. storage. So, so I'm thinking about sort of like somehow efficiency, like how much we waste. Food waste, yeah. So can we put that on food availability, yeah. food waste, right? Some of that happens not only, I mean, when we think of food waste, we think of like the food we throw out from our, our fridge, right? Like we have that bag of apples that nobody bothered to eat, and we can toss it. Well, the biggest problem with food waste, though, is it happens long before that bag ever gets in our fridge. It happens on the field. If it doesn't meet a certain color, like tomatoes, for instance, if they don't meet a certain color, they don't harvest them because they can't sell them. Uh, there was a, a, a colleague that I had at Feeding America uh, who said they, they had recovered a, uh, a tractor trailer full of grapes. 
you know those bags of grapes that you buy mm -hmm. pre-weighed? Mm -hmm. well, what they do when they get those into a distribution center is they weigh a sampling of the bags and if those are not meeting the standard, they reject the whole truck. So they weighed these and because they were off by all three or four ounces, they rejected the truck. Wow. Luckily, Feeding America and other food, uh, other organizations that address food waste are able to come in and say, no, we can use that. They're still fine grapes. They just have the bags are misweighed. Um, otherwise, they would have gone in the trash. We don't all, all the throw. Yeah, so, so please. How about uh, well, this one? How do we? One of the big misconceptions is that poverty is the only cause of hunger. There are people who are poor who are not necessarily hungry. There are people who are hungry who are not necessarily poor. And that gets to that food availability, right? Um, food availability, a war, uh, which we can put around here. One of the things driving that number going up, conflict. We have a lot of countries who are in conflict, uh, conflict situations. Or, or what they, they call fragility, uh, fragile situations, which means that the infrastructure is kind of hanging by a balance and very precarious. So is most of that hunger then in places like uh, the East or in places like Africa? Where, where yeah, it's just mostly in Africa. Mostly. Mostly in Africa. In fact, the changes that have happened like in Asia, where you, before, say 20, 30 years ago, you had really high rates of hunger in Southeast Asia. They've done well, quite a bit to bring those down precipitously. Uh, and so we don't really see it as much in Southeast Asia, where we see the increases. South, uh, Southern and Eastern Africa, especially, have areas like Yemen, Somalia, um, Syria had a spike in hunger because of the, uh, you know, the, the conflict there. When you have that kind of conflict for Central African Republic, you know, these kinds of places. Yeah, the, uh, um, when you have that kind of conflict, or even where it's not outright conflict, but just fragility, you, you, you know, farming is pretty careful business. You have to plant at a certain time. If there's people who are on your fields, if there's conflict in your area, you can't get out to plant. Or if there's sanctions, you can't get parts for your tractor. That becomes a real problem. You know? When I was a child, I was always there with hungry kids in China. And right. My children were children who were hungry kids in Africa. Right. That's why you had to eat for dinner. Yeah. But, but that hasn't evolved really to any other judgment. I mean, now it's still there's yeah. some kids. China has solved their problem pretty much. For the most part, they have, yeah. Um, one of the things that they're measuring now, uh, they started to look at, is um, when, when you have uh, a large national rate that's come down, how are the people who are still in those areas who are hungry captured? Like, how, how do we capture that? Not done and captured. How do we capture that data? Right, uh, because before they wouldn't even measure it, and so if like in general, so say all of us, out of all of us, say two of us were food insecure, well the UN would say that we are food secure, we're not hungry. Well, what about those two people? Right, because those two people in lots of communities add up quite a bit. So they still have some in places like China, uh, yeah, India, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, uh, but the rates have been coming down, and, and really it's Africa that we're seeing it rapidly increase, um, unfortunately. Some of that too is another one here, you put drought. They want climate change. Climate change. Uh, we can say what we want here in the US about the climate and climate science. Um, we shouldn't say what we want, but we should say what scientists want to say, but we, uh, but we can say what we want, but in uh, the countries where we have communities that we accompany as a church, it's just a reality and it's been a reality. They can't plant, the growing seasons are shorter. Um, even in Washtenaw, yeah, this year, yeah, look at what the rains did to our, to our corn crop. And that's true across Michigan. Look how many farmers were waiting for uh, um, whether or not to plant or to collect the insurance, right? Uh, we drove past a cornfield, uh, where were we? Just drove past one uh, the other day. It hasn't been harvested yet. Can't be harvested yet. Because of the rains, they had to plant so late, right? Uh, <clears throat> those kinds of seasons, especially for farmers, you only have so many seasons to make it work and to keep it going. Uh, what happens when some of those seasons are rained out or too dry to be able to do anything? So we're seeing that even now here in, in Michigan. Right? Uh, but the communities we accompany overseas have been facing that for decades. In fact, some of the first climate refugees in the U.S. Uh, are um, Lutheran. Uh, there's a Lutheran church in, uh, on a barrier island called Shishmaref in Alaska. 
they're being evacuated because they, the ice isn't developing to protect the coastline. Mm -hmm. And so they're losing 12 feet of land every year on a very small barrier island. So they are among some of the first climate refugees in the US being forced to migrate. The others are down in um, uh, the, the Delta, Louisiana. Um, Ile de Jean Charles, which is an island down there that's been occupied for hundreds of years, not thousands of years, and that's disappearing. So they're being moved as well. Um, yeah, so climate change, huge in terms of food availability. Um, also, I think lack of storage or food safety with climate change. One of the other, the other factors we don't think of is we usually go right to food production, right? But think of what happens when there's lots of rain and there's lots of flooding or, or uh, you know, at risk of waterborne illness. Or think of what happens to your food being too hot, right? Especially vegetables or meats being too hot and the risk of salmonella, right? Uh, or even some of the other health-related risks. Uh, overheating, dehydration that, that you can have for people who have um, compromised, uh, you know, uh, uh, compromised conditions, compromising conditions. So another one would be health, right? Uh, here, I'm just going to have a couple really quickly. Criminal justice system for poverty in the U.S. If you go to prison in the U.S., you're, you are statistically you will earn 40% less over the course of your lifetime than if you had never gone to prison. And that's not controlled for length of time. If you go to prison in the US, you will earn statistically 40% less over the course of your lifetime. So we have a lot of you know, issues where you have communities, we have returning citizens who can't get jobs. Right? Uh, in New York, <clears throat> New York State, if you have been to prison, you are not able to work as a barber. As a what? Barber. Barber, cut hair, yeah, cut hair, and not. And it has nothing to do with if you did something illegal with your scissors. <laughs> if you committed a crime, committed a felony, you can't be a barber. Why? Why not? Right. So you 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 are prevented from some of these occupations. Um, one of the things that that I think people miss about ELC World Hunger and the ministries that we do together as a church is that you know they, we they focus here. Food availability, right? And if you have a problem with food availability, what do you do? You start a pantry, right? And so when we think of like the church responding to hunger, we think of the church providing pantries, right? Pantries are a good thing. Community kitchens are a good thing, right? That's one piece of this whole puzzle. But we also have people working on advocacy around climate change. We're working with farmers to learn ways to adapt to a changing climate. We have <laughs> ministries that are working specifically with people recently released from incarceration. We also have ministries working with people who've been victims of crime, especially domestic violence victims, so that they can be safe, have shelter, get jobs, things like that. Um, we're also working uh, in advocacy internationally and domestically on, on equitable distribution, making sure that food gets to the right people. Uh, transportation, we have ministries that have provided bikes or cars. Right, to make sure that people can, uh, can access that. War, uh, in Kenya, we had a uh, ministry that we supported this year that was working on uh, um, peace, peace building and conflict resolution skills among youth and young people. Right, they had intertribal violence, and so they were working with them to learn these skills because when you have intertribal violence, the first thing that gets burned are your crops, right? Uh, or your home, and then you have to rebuild. And so we were working on that as well. And you, the thing, you mentioned uh, government uh, or uh, technology too. You know, access to not just kitchen technology, but access to the internet. If you're in an area that you need to know how to use the internet to get a job, you need to be able to access the internet. Healthcare. Uh, ELC World Hunger is one of the prime, primary ways that our church, as church, uh, supports ministries related to healthcare. Hospitals, clinics, training of doctors, primary internal health care, all that. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, but you mentioned uh, the government. I just want to mention government. If you look at the way laws are made, even in the U.S., so you take, for instance, laws about hunting and fishing. The Kurok Indians in the Claymont Mountains in Northern California, one of their biggest issues, their traditional ways of gathering food are now illegal because hunting and fishing is based on recreation, not subsistence. And so they can't go out and fish like they would fish 
uh, to get enough food to eat because they have a creole limit of two fish. And two fish isn't going to feed your household. Right? And so working with communities like that to make sure that laws are, are passed in ways <coughs> that, um, that are sensitive to that, and that allow people to do what they need. Uh, do those laws apply on, on Indian land? Because of the way it's structured in the Claymont Mountains, yeah. Really? Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, but they're looking at ways of like preserving, or not preserving, uh, looking at ways of allowing them to um, have like an exception because they're uh, where they're fishing. Uh, the other problem there is access to water. So they had another um, group, which name is the, I think it was the Shasta, but I can't remember now. They were going to dam their, their river, so they want to have access to water. To the, to the waters that they use for survival and for their retreat. <coughs> and so our, 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 our organization, our, our ministry, was working together with them. Uh, let's see if we have time. Yeah, we have time. I want to share with you one story because uh, um, I think this story speaks to the way that our ministry responds, not just to, to hunger, but really to what lies beneath it, which is injustice. Right? Uh, and so this story comes from our ministry in Guatemala that's supported by, by Yossi Wotunger. Put this here. This was working earlier. voy a lavar, ahí ves, consigo mi jabón, un libro, mi azúcar, así crecieron todos mis hijos. No tengo dinero para dar más estudio. Se sí, fue allá, gracias a ustedes. Está apoyando ahí allá para que aprenden más. Desde pequeña, nuestro, mi papá nos dejó abandonado y él se tuvo que alejar de mi mamá. Y mi mamá tuvo que ver cómo salir adelante, cómo darnos de alimentar y cómo darnos estudios. He visto mujeres que no pueden seguir es, estudiando y se, sus padres lo obligan a casarse porque ya no tienen el dinero para seguir estudiando. Hay familia que le da solo así la oportunidad porque son en mi pensamiento mío es así dar la oportunidad sea hombre o sea mujer porque eh, nuestra vida no hay Dios nos ha dado la vida igual una mujer y un hombre y también para que un día ella que tenga oportunidad después en su futuro para que ella sepa cómo sostenerse así en el futuro 
viven en un contexto donde siempre les dicen que no se puede, donde siempre les ponen un rol de estar en la cocina, de cuidar a los hermanos, de atender a los papás, de tener un marido. Ellas pueden descubrir sus dones junto con otras señoritas, escuchar el mensaje de que sí pueden, de que sí hay algo distinto en la vida para ellas. Yo me siento bien compartir conocimientos con otras niñas porque cada quien tiene su, su conocimiento diferente y de cada niña que, pas, que pasamos conociendo aprendemos de ellas. Entonces se está preparando a los líderes, se está preparando a los jóvenes, se está preparando a las mujeres, se está preparando a los niños para que cuando las señoritas regresen a su comunidad, ellas lleguen a un ambiente que sea receptivo, que las va a recibir, que las va a tomar en cuenta, que las va a escuchar especialmente. Cuando vine yo no podía costurar, pero aquí lo aprendí y he aprendido cómo hacer pasteles, paños franceses, y así, y he aprendido a trapear aquí también, como man, manualidades también. Y yo podría hacer un pastel allá para vender y un poco hacer las manualidades para mostrarles allá a mi familia o a los miembros de la iglesia. A veces se enojan porque, porque piensan ellos que no tienen derecho la mujer de hablar o ser líder en la comunidad. Que yo estoy aprendiendo y voy a enseñar a ellos cambio porque pensamos que ah, no era así, vamos a cambiar así pensamos sí, porque ahí en mi comunidad no hay carretera, no hay nada no hay centro de salud y cuando voy a graduarme y crear mi, propio, mi propia clínica Pensamos que si todos los grupos están representados en liderazgos, eh, la mujer debería de tener más representación para poder tener acceso y más oportunidades, porque al no tener representación, en ambientes y en espacios de liderazgo, la mujer no va a tener oportunidad no Entonces es un cambio cultural. Al cambiar una cultura no es una cosa sencilla que se va a dar de la noche a la mañana. Nosotros sabemos que no va a ser un resultado posiblemente en esta generación, pero las siguientes generaciones que vienen después de estas señoritas que están acá ya van a recibir una información distinta. Y entonces eso va a ser un cambio generacional. <coughs> So, you know, some of the, the text there at the bottom gets a little washed out with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, 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 with the captions. You know, but Casa Milagro, this ministry in Guatemala, is working with these young girls to make sure that they have a shot, right? That, uh, that no matter what they choose, they're choosing it with access to all the resources they need to, cho to choose freely. And part of that means equipping them for, uh, for jobs where they'll be able to make, make money and be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. When we look at hunger, we realize hunger is just a symptom of all of these deeper injustices. Whether it's the injustices that the girls face in, in Guatemala, whether it's the injustices that arise because of our treatment of, of our environment, whether it's injustices that arise because of war or discrimination or poverty, hunger is just a symptom. Uh, and so the ministries that we support together really are aimed at, at, at getting uh, at the root causes, uh, as, we, as we like to say, of, of that. Uh, of, of the uh, of the symptom, and that's not uh, 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 separate from who we are as Lutherans. It's actually the way that Luther was in the Reformation, right? So if we think back to like Luther and the Reformation, right? So Luther posts his kicks off the Reformation by posting his ninety-five theses, right? Remember what the ninety-five theses were arguing against? Um, indulgences. indulgences, right? So indulgences were these little slips of paper that basically allowed you or, or a, a, a deceased family member uh, time off from purgatory. So you could go to heaven without paying for your sins uh, in, in, uh, in purgatory. Now, th these were nothing new in Luther's time. They'd been, they had been around for, for centuries before. What was new in the 1500s was the church started selling them. 
Uh, and the, one of the reasons they started selling them, like you can see here, this is an indulgent seller. It's a woodcut of an indulgent seller here. One of the reasons they started selling them uh, was because of a guy uh, by the name of Jakob Fugger. Right? Jakob Fugger was the wealthiest person in the world at the time. And in fact, his wealth still today would make him one of the wealthiest people in history. He was a banker in Europe. He helped bankroll the Crusades. He helped bankroll the, the, the building of uh, St. Peter's in the Vatican. And he also helped provide a loan to a guy, uh, uh, to a guy named the uh, Albrecht of Mainz, who became Archbishop. Uh, uh, in Germany at the time, and needed to take out a loan to pay for like investments and all this stuff. So Albrecht takes on this loan from Jakob Fugger, which was given at very high interest, and he had to pay back that loan in addition to the interest. So he writes a letter to the Pope and asks him, can I sell indulgences to help pay this loan back? And the Pope not only says, yeah, that's a good idea, go ahead, but I'm going to do that too to help pay back my loan to Jakob Fugger. Uh, and the Fugger family uh, to, uh, that, that went to help build uh, St. Peter's in the Vatican. And so they start uh, having these traveling preachers who would go around selling indulgences. And who wanted to buy one, right? This slip of paper will get you, your dearly departed mother out of purgatory. Uh, your brother who just passed away will get straight to heaven if you give this much money to the church. Uh, so these folks are giving up all of their savings to buy these indulgences. And for some of the poorer folks, they're giving up the money that should have been going to bread and clothing and education for their kids to pay these indulgences. Little do they know that it's all lining the pockets of the bank right, to pay back high interest on loans. Luther knows this, and he's not happy about it. Right? So he sees these indulgences not only as theologically problematic, but, but as, as economically and socially problematic. See, these are from his, uh, uh, the 95 Theses. Christians are to be taught that he who sees a needy man and passes him by and yet gives his money for indulgences buys God's wrath. Right? Uh, or he says later on in the 95 Theses, why does not the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest crashes, build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money rather than the money of poor peasants? He sees this injustice that's happening, where the church is defrauding people in poverty, and he's mad about it, right? I don't know if you were taught that in catechism, I wasn't. It's, it's, and I don't mean this in any bad way, but yeah. I didn't think that regular people were allowed to charge interest. Was Yaakov Jewish? I don't know if he was Jewish or not. Yeah. I believe he was Jewish. He was yeah. 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 Now the interesting no thing. Now the interesting thing is that, yeah. that there were there was a way at the time that the, the Catholic Church was charging interest too, but they did it in a really strange way through something called the Zins, which Luther had a problem with as well. He saw all these ways that the church was engaging in these practices that were you know, supposed to be against the, the way that they were behaving, but also were defrauding people in poverty. What the Zins was was essentially a land contract. Uh, and so you would, uh, so if I, I can, I can give you my land and charge you rent, right? By and what you would do is pay me part of your your harvest. Right? Well, what they started doing in the 1500s is they started doing that except with money. So I'm going to give you my thousand dollar. I'm going to give you my ten guilders, and you're going to give me a guilder every year, right? Uh, rent on that money. It's interest, it's interesting. right? But they said, no, 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 it's not interest. It's a sin. It's, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, this is not this is not what it is. And it wasn't so even so much uh, for Luther the problem of with there wasn't the problem of interest so much as dishonesty. Uh, and even with interest, it wasn't so much that it was interest, so much that it was really exorbitant interest. Right? And so the the, the, the question of interest and usury is is really kind of interesting. Uh, and so, yeah, it's this, this problem of, of interest. And meanwhile, he's saying, you know, you're, you're telling the people that they can't, you know, that they have to be honest in their dealings and that they have to um, be giving money to the church, believing that the money is going to go back to help the church, help the community, give them the glory of God. It's going to fund building projects and uh, expensive investments for people like Albert and Mines. Luther's like, you're defrauding people. Right? This is fraud. And the church is doing it, you know. So even if he has uh, the uh, um, uh, 
the critique of Fugger and Banky, you know, tied really closely to the anti-Judaism that was around at the time, his critique is really with the church. That you you are the ones giving the justification for this to happen. And that's problematic to Luther. Right? So he even uh, Alright, so does that answer that question? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's complex, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we'll do a little Luther quiz. Test your Luther knowledge. <coughs> I see you're already like so happy, you're just like, ah, oh, ready for this. But no. All right, Luther quiz. Did this come from Martin Luther or from the late 1990s World Trade Organization protests in Seattle? This one's really nice. Where once the rogue's eye and greedy belly of a merchant find that people must have his wares or that the buyer is poor and needs them, he takes advantage of him and raises the price. And tell me, isn't that an unchristian thing to do? Yep. The language there pretty much says Yeah, Luther. It's the rogue's eye. We we don't have that we don't have that (laughs) colorful we don't have that colorful kind of language anymore. Right? What about international trading companies are a bottomless pit of avarice and wrongdoing. They control all commodities, raise and lower prices at their pleasure, oppress and ruin all the small businessmen. And because of it the world must be sucked dry and the money sink and swim in their gods. So critique of of large conglomerates. Mm -hmm. Luther or the, the uh, more modern protest. Let's keep going here. Daily the poor are defrauded. New burdens and high prices are imposed. Everyone misuses the market in his own willful, conceited, and arrogant way, as if it were his right and privilege to sell his goods as dearly as he pleases without a word of criticism. Luther, Luther or modern editorial? Luther. Luther. How about this one? Selling ought not to be an act that is entirely within your own power and discretion without law or limit. Civil authorities ought to establish, quote, rules and regulations, including, quote, ceilings on prices. It's a trick. They're all Luther. (laughs) Every one of them is Luther. Luther's theological critique of the church was tied really closely to an economic critique of the church. And of the market. So you have capitalism kind of emerging at the, same, at, at the time in, uh, in Luther's day. And he sees that he's not opposed to the market. He's not, you know, he actually believes that you know, the market is, that that's where we're living out our vocation, is by participating in the market. But what he sees is that this place that is supposed to be a place where we live out our vocation and community is being corrupted. Right? And it's being corrupted by the very people who are supposed to be taken care of the church. The church is supposed to influence government and the economy in ways that help shape it to be just. Not to be Christian, but to be just right? and fair and equitable. Uh, and so this is a deep, deep part of his, his critique. If you look through the catechisms, which were supposed to be used as like the basic education for Lutherans, every single description of the commandments has an economic side as well. In fact, it opens with an economic critique. But they all have this economic side. So when you talk about uh, um, theft, he talks about the, 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 the commandment against stealing. He says, you know where this happens is in the market. This happens when we charge high prices, because we can. And it defrauds people who are in poverty. So Luther had this sharp economic critique, too, looking at the really at the root causes of the poverty that was around. Right? Uh, and he responds to this. I don't want to finish this up quickly. He responds to this by talking about the ways that worship is supposed to form us to be just people in the world. Right? So he talks about communion as one of these. And I'm just going to use communion as an example. There are two things in the Lutheran church that are required to take communion authentically, according to Luther. Do you know what they are? All right. I'll give you a hint. One's not baptism. But don't tell anyone that. Confession. Right. Confession. Close, close. Uh, the the uh, uh, penitence of the heart that comes with confession. So an awareness of our sin and our need for God's grace and a willingness to bear the burdens of the other people at the table with us. Those are the two things that you need. An awareness of your own neediness before God and an awareness of your role in helping respond to the neediness of the people at the table with you. So he writes about communion. Here your heart must go out in love and learn that this is a sacrament of love. As love and support are given you, you in turn must render love and support to Christ and his needy ones. I'm going to skip this one in favor of a couple others. This one at the bottom here is the one I find most striking. For the sacrament of Holy Communion 
has no blessing or significance unless love grows daily and so changes a person that he's made one with all others. No blessing or significance unless love grows daily and you're made one with the other people with you. Luther saw this connection between worship and service in the community that he believed was, was unseverable. You, can, you cannot pretend to be a Christian on Sunday if you're going out practicing injustice on Monday. And that was part of his biggest critique of the church of his time, is that you're practicing injustice while you're preaching the gospel. And those two things have to be related. To respond to, the, uh, um, to some of the need that was around him, he worked with Lutheran churches to establish a systematic way of responding to, to, to hunger and poverty. Uh, it was especially called, I'm running out of time here to, to describe all of it, but it was called a, uh, a common chest. So it was a literal box in the church in Wittenberg that contained offerings and gifts and money and things like that. Uh, and then four people in the community were given keys to it. And basically what would happen is someone in need would come and petition them for help from the common chest. The four stewards would decide together how to distribute it and then would give to them from the chest. Now that chest went to pay for immediate needs, but it also went to refinance high interest loans, went for re-education of underemployed people, a mental health hospital, just the mm -hmm. 1520s, a mental health hospital in Wittenberg, mm -hmm. a physician for, uh, for poor patients, and care for orphans, uh, were some of the things that that went to. Luther was so enamored with this that he said every Lutheran church should have two pieces of furniture. They should have an altar and they should have a common chest a systematic way that we're responding to, to uh, need in our community around us. And eventually, most of them around Germany did. Those, those took off pretty precipitously. Uh, in fact, there was an organization in the United States starting in the early 20th century called the Community Chest. And now, today, we know of it as United Way. But it started off from these basic ideas. And you can draw a dotted line from those early churches with this literal box to the way that social democracy and social uh, um, provision is done in uh, Northern European countries today. Yeah. And it's in Monopoly. Right, exactly, <laughs> yes, yeah, community chess, right? But it's sort of that common chess. The way that we organize that today is through ELC World Hunger, uh, our response to, to need in, in our communities. One of the things that's been, like most difficult to understand is just how, how like deep and pervasive the ministry is. Uh, so ELC World Hunger, when like when your gifts go to ELC World Hunger, they're going to this large network of, of ministries that are all working together. Uh, so ELC World Hunger supports work that's done by congregations, which are U.S.-based churches in the ELCA, companions, which are churches we're in relationship overseas, uh, and then partners, which are organizations that we have an established relationship with. Uh, one of the things to to remind folks, well, two things to remind folks. First of all, we don't support work in areas where we don't have a relationship. And if something happens to that relationship, we, we don't support the work. Um, not because we're trying to buy the relationship, but because if we aren't in relationship, we don't really know what's going on. Right. And and what we're trying to build is not just feeding people, but a just world where all people are fed. And it happens by building relationships. Uh, so we support uh, um, projects in areas where we have relationships. Um, the other thing to uh, uh, to point out that a lot of folks don't know, none of the funding that comes to ELC World Hunger comes through like general benevolences. So like the general offering that's sent to like the Synod and the Synod on the Churchwide, none of that supports ELC World Hunger or the Food Disaster Response. Those are designated ministries only. So only when you when you designate something for World Hunger does it actually get to, to ELC World Hunger. Just something to keep in mind. Um, through most of our companions are members with us in the Lutheran World Federation. Right? Uh, and then we have partners like Lutheran World Relief, uh, Church World Service. Uh, Means and Sir Boldy are two smaller partners. Means works on food waste issues here in the U.S. Uh, Sir Boldy provides service opportunities for youth um, in uh, the ELCA in about 10 cities uh, around the country during the summer. Then there's other ELCA ministries that are also funded by ELCA World Hunger. Those include ELCA Advocacy. Uh, are you familiar with ELCA Advocacy? A little bit, so now you head. So we, uh, as a church, we have an office uh, in Washington, D.C. that works on federal uh, policy uh, that's supported by World Hunger. We also have 16 state public policy offices working on state-based issues, whether it's child nutrition or, or school lunches, uh, access to clean water, things like that. Um, and then we also have an office that we share with the Lutheran World Federation in New York at the United Nations. 
And so when the talks are happening about the sustainable development goals, we have representatives that are there. Um, all that is supported by World Hunger because we know policy impacts hunger and poverty as well. Yeah. I have a quick question. Sure. How long has ELCA World Hunger been in existence and what are some of the things that they have? We're talking about all the stuff that's still bad. Right. But what are what are some of the major um, accomplishments, if you want to call it? Yeah, that? yeah, that's a really good question. So ELCA World Hunger has been around since the beginning of the ELCA in 1988. Uh, but we trace our kind of lineage back. Did you say 1988? Yeah. That's how, it's that young? Yeah, the ELC just started in like 97, 88. I had no idea. Yeah, so we trace our lineage though back to like the, the hunger ministries that were in the predecessor bodies that became the ELCA. So we say it's been around about half a century, about 50 years. Uh, so it's fairly young because the church is fairly young. But it goes back to those earlier uh, churches as well. Now, in terms of what we've been able to do, uh, you know, as we saw like with the, 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 the rate of hunger while it's upticked in the, the last few years, it's we come down pretty precipitously and still down from where we were in the 80s. If you remember the 80s, uh, remember those commercials, uh, like the f pictures of famine, things like that? We're still down from there. We've made tremendous progress. In the U.S., we continue to make tremendous progress. Uh, a lot of it in the U.S., too, is uh, traced to some of our work with advocacy. So you asked about a success. Our state office in Ohio helped to... Um, uh, protect millions of dollars of funding for food pantries in Ohio that was about to be cut in the governor's budget about two years ago. Uh, and so they mobilized their network along with other partners uh, and actually got not only protected what was going to be cut, but got more so that the, the pantries and feeding ministries in Ohio could be, uh, could be protected, right? Uh, if you look at um, uh, in Flint, for instance, here in, in Washington, uh, so Flint, uh, when the water crisis happened there, everyone was focused on water. Uh, and one of the things that our congregation there, Salem, was focused on, in addition to water, uh, was the food, food access. <clears throat> Their pantry was worried that so many people were getting to water issues that they weren't going to have enough support for, for their pantry for people who were hungry and needed food in addition to water. So you'll see where hunger stepped in. In addition to accompanying them in a lot of different ways, um, I, I was the point person kind of between church wide and and so our ministries, Lutheran Disaster Response and World Hunger, accompanied them you know, throughout that. Uh, but we also provided immediate funding to their pantry to make sure that they could provide for the community. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, in Kentucky, uh, we worked with an organization to, to help provide a, uh, a food pantry there with seeds and livestock so that people in the community could be growing their own food in addition to support the pantry. All of these community efforts add together to an impact. That 11.1% that we saw that's come down since the recession, that's not down because we wished it down. You know what I mean? Like, it's come down because, like, like your church here has worked together because uh, um, organizations that we've supported together, like SOS over in Ypsilanti, or Micah like 6 up in Pontiac, it's because they've all worked together to bring that down. Uh, one of the things that we're working on is internationally to help report on that. Right, so like you have the sustainable development goals, which are these goals for governments to, to meet these targets, and hunger, and gender discrimination, uh, you know, things like this. We know that faith-based communities, churches, are some of the primary ways that, that those, those targets are gonna get met. But they're not reported on, right? And so all the other government will only report what the government's doing, and not what the faith-based community is doing. So we've been working with the Lutheran World Federation to report on that. Uh, so that we can share, point out, this is actually what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think of the trust that we have, too, and just one, one more story I'll share. We heard from a bishop in Liberia uh, about a year after the Ebola outbreak, uh, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was talking about the early days of the outbreak, when they knew that things were bad and they were going to get a whole lot worse, and they were trying to work with the government and other entities to get them to make a change. Uh, and he told us, it was not until the church got involved that, that the tide turned against Ebola. When the church got involved, involved, the tide turned because the church had the trust in the communities and it had the trust in the places of power. And it had a voice to make sure those places, the, the, those voices on the ground could be heard by the people in power. Mm -hmm. So the church got involved, the tide shifted. And I remember it was 
you know, ministries like ministries that we support, that we're supporting a lot of these clinics and a lot of these people who are doing that. Uh, and so if anyone says, well, the church is, you hear these stories of the church, church dying, the church being ineffective, that's not true of where we're at. Our membership may be, may be declining numbers-wise, but what we're accomplishing in the world is worth praise and, and it's worth participating in and it's worth lifting up as something that God is doing through the people that, that are in our church and the people that we're in relationship with. Making a lot of big strides there. A lot more to do yet. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Brian, you're going to have to stop. I yep. Uh, sorry, just saw it. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah, you got to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>